Hi guys and welcome to another episode of the Boxing Coalition. My name is Cam and joining me tonight, Nayota. Hope you're well, Nayota. Pretty lackluster weekend overall. Not many fights and the fights we did have, quality level was pretty low. Um, I guess we start in Latvia, Nayota. Uh, Marius Bredas facing Mike Perez. Trim down, slim down Mike Perez um, for both... Uh, position to go forward in the World Boxing Super Series and for Bredis' WBC Cruiserweight title. I saw some comments from you over the weekend. You didn't enjoy the fight. I don't think anyone that I follow on Twitter enjoyed the fight. So let's uh, take your thoughts, Naoto. Yeah, you know, it was it was just a clinch fest, basically. And honestly, you know, there, there's some people that want to say, like like Kimo, for instance, that, uh, you know, the clinching was kind of from both sides. But really, to me, Bredis was initiating most of it yeah you know he was kind of taking advantage of the fact that he was in at home and could get away with pretty much whatever he wanted to do in there so the clinching was crazy from him you know it's like he would sometimes throw punches and then clinch or then clinch without even throwing punches and i think in part that kind of threw perez's rhythm off you know i mean um you know i thought the fight was reasonably competitive uh i i agree with the judge that had it you know eight rounds the four for brady's but um yeah, you know, like the, the just the, he with the way that he was fighting was, I guess strategically speaking, you know, I guess smart for him because he was able to like largely throw um, Perez's rhythm off, and he was catching him pretty pretty nicely with some of those right hands. Um, even appeared to kind of momentarily stun him a couple of times, but there was never any like real follow up from that. The follow up was always to grab him, you know, and pre- prevent Perez from a- being able to get off any kind of counter shots or um, any any kind of follow up. In, in, ter- ter- in terms of uh, trying to get some like some get back, but um, but I mean Perez, he kind of he looked okay, but didn't necessarily look up to par in terms of you know some of the stuff that we've seen from him in the past. I think that uh, to a degree he's kind of gotten over the uh, the Magomed uh, situation, um, but you know you could tell that so that some of the reflexes weren't quite there in order to really like light up those uh, those combinations that he would do in the past. But also, I think part of that was, is owed to Brady's, you know, kind of dirty strategy of what he did, you know, and kind of leading with his head and all that stuff. But yeah, well, it was a pretty ugly fight. Um, you know, like like the pretty much the worst parts of Brook versus Porter, kind of all compiled and stretched out. Uh, and you know, you could tell that Perez could have been potentially more competitive against him had uh, Brady's not been kind of allowed to get away with all that stuff. But I mean, uh, even still um it was it was a it was a relatively even fight but it was one that was um kind of marred I, th- I think it could have been a better fight had uh the two of them fought a little bit more cleanly under the official rules so it's, it's kind of unfortunate that we had kind of a dud in the world boxing super series after some of the action that we've seen so far yeah i think we got spoiled with the the past uh three events they've put on so we're, we were kind of due a, a shitty fight and yeah it was a shitty fight it's crazy because I initially was watching the Sky Card, which was on Saturday, and a lot of people looking at my Twitter feed turned over to the the Super Series fights and kind of you know skipped the main headline of of the Liverpool card, which is fair because a lot of people weren't really interested. But my OCD wouldn't allow that, so I continued to watch Sky and just kind of read updates on Twitter that what was happening with this Braders fight and. When I read it, it was kind of crazy, man, because it put me off watching the fight. And then Kimo watched it and talked about it and he said it was an awful fight. And I didn't really want to watch it because I thought I'm just going to waste 40, 45 minutes of my life here. But obviously, do the pod, we have to kind of watch the fights. I did watch it today. And yeah, with everything you said, Bredis just initiated the clinches too many times. There was even one moment, I think it was quite early, maybe second or third round, maybe fourth, where he threw a punch and you can tell... He only threw it to put his arm in his position to engage a clinch. It was crazy, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like... You, you, he's you trained can, for it. Exactly. <laughs> he's thrown this wide hook, but he's not thrown it as a hook. He, he's trying to, like, engage the clinch. It was it was awful, man. And yeah. I, I, I feel bad for Perez. I think Perez going into it with so much, you know, time away from the ring, the fact that he had that nonsense fight a couple of months ago, which basically did nothing for him. 
And maybe if he would have had a, a decent tune-up, then went into this Breeders' fight, he may have had more of a chance. But to your point, when a guy just upsets your rhythm so much, when the referee is awful as that dude, man, that Luigi-looking motherfucker, man, like, he is awful, man. I've seen him many a time, and yeah. every time I've seen him officiate, he's been poor. Very poor. Like, yeah, I don't he, know why he, he allows keeps... he allows whoever the hometown guy is to get away with whatever the fuck he wants. Basically. Yeah, he 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 he's off. I don't know how he keeps getting these big gigs, man. They like they need to really seriously look into that dude. And um, and again, going back to the Twitter situation, I've read you know from you know a couple of weeks ahead of time, maybe when the Super Series got announced, people were saying you know. I got Bradis up there maybe is the the top three to kind of go ahead and win maybe top two people kind of favoring Usyk and uh, Gassiev but like Bradis was up there especially with being a champ on that so my Twitter feed went from that before the fight to fuck Bradis I never want to see him again after the fight which was which was quite hilarious I thought because it's amazing how one fight can just turn people off someone so much it it was hilarious, man. My Twitter. Feed. Yeah, I mean, I think they were kind of basing it probably off of you know what, however much they had seen of Bradis before, which is primarily him kind of knocking out guys that just aren't on his level to begin with. So you might get the impression like, oh, like this guy can punch. You know, this guy's kind of a a rough house. You know, fun to watch fighter. But when it came to fighting a guy that was truly on his level, like a Perez, a guy that could you know force him into uncomfortable situations, he he reverted to being coming you know a freaking bear hugger, <laughs> the John Reese at his finest, you know. So yeah, that's I, I didn't really think uh, a ton of of Brady's before the fight. You know, I actually picked for her as the to beat him. I was wrong, of course, but um, you know I don't I don't, wouldn't. At all, feel bad about my pick, considering the the manner of victory in which uh, Brady's actually did win. So it is what it is. Yeah, and again to the ref, there were situations where you know they've both just gone into a kind of clinch, and he's like, both of them might have an arm free, and he's just breaking them up straight right. away. He wasn't kind of letting it work on the inside. Not that either guy yeah, has really Perez got was it. Low. Perez was primarily the one really trying to kind of you know get get some shots off. You know, yeah. Hit, you know, hit him in the belly, hit him in, you know, in the kidney or whatever, you know, whatever uh, body was available to him to be able to hit. Yeah. And um, people were kind of quizzy, quiz, quizzing me about the, the head clash point deduction, but that's that's the rule with the WBC. Like, if there's a head clash and, and the fight continues, the person yeah. that um, wasn't injured automatically gets a point deducted. That's just how they do it. So um, Yeah, that's, that's a WBC rule that's pretty much... Um, allowed everywhere else but the United States. They 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 actually enforce that rule pretty much everywhere else in international competition. But why not, not the, the States? US. I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I, th- I think it might have to do with uh, whether the fight is being held under the Association of Boxing Commission's rules or whether it's being held under the WBC rules. So I'm guessing that in most jurisdictions where they there's no ABC affiliation, then the WBC rules wind up taking over. They take precedence. Yeah. Um, but yeah, poor fight overall. I think Usyk beats Brady's quite easily. Um, Perez, you know, if he if he goes back rebuilds, get gets a decent um, fight in between where he can actually work a bit and we can see him again. Because I, I agree with you. Like he he lost something after that Mago fight. Like he didn't have the same kind of hunger. And I I, I thought him kind of complaining to the ref was. Unnecessary because the ref's not going to change his view. It was good that the ref decided to take a point away from Raiders for the excessive holding. He, he did, I don't really see him giving that many warnings, to be honest, but it's good that at least he got a point deducted. Um, yeah, eventually. Yeah, eventually. But yeah, like, uh, if Perez kind of. I, I'm really impressed the fact that he he dedicated himself and he lost that weight. With a lot of heavyweights, especially yeah. Cuban, they're just lazy, man. So the fact that he got himself in excellent shape, man, he, he looked really, really good. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, from from the times that he was able to kind of get some shots off, I mean, he looked like his reflexes were there, you know, for the most part. I mean, maybe slightly a tick slower, but you know, that kind of comes with age sometimes and wear and tear. Um, but you know, he he looked very much still a viable contender and everything. Um, I know yeah. there there was rumors that he might have had trouble making weight, and he was he had that he put on that whole show at the weigh-in where he ate a piece of cake before yeah. <laughs> weighing in. Uh, but you know who knows? But he still looks like a pretty viable contender, whether it's at cruiserweight or heavyweight. And uh, you know, I think I think there can be some very good fights uh, with him involved. So I'm hoping to see 
him get some, some more opportunities against um, higher level fighters at the weights. Yeah, making weight was a piece of cake to him, obviously. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, it just it, he for me he got caught a bit too much with Bradis' uppercut. Like he, he, Bradis didn't even disguise the uppercut, and he was getting caught with it. But um, the head movement was quite decent, and yeah, man, I, I was like Mike Perez, man. So I kind of hope he he rebuilds and um, does something that, that yeah. Apart from like maybe the upper guys at cruiserweight, like the kind of mid division, it's it's uh, it's quite um, it's quite open, and I think a lot that there, there could be a lot of mix and matching and good fights being made in in that kind of mid section of cruiserweight. So hopefully he can kind of insert himself in there and you know do do pretty well. Right, right. I mean, shit, get him in there with like Shumanov or Tabidi or one of those guys. I think he makes for a good fight. Or Michael Hunter. Shumanov didn't Shumanov retire? Did he? I didn't even I didn't even hear about that. What the, the Shumanov the Kazakh that was... beat um, the Kazakh that yeah, you know, maybe, made his own gym? Yeah, forever, forever alone. Yeah, he, he was supposed to fight and his his fight got cancelled. Then he then he got rescheduled and then he basically retired because of uh, eye injury. He he reti- basically... I, yeah, I didn't even know about it, man. Yeah, see, that's that's uh, that's the story of Shumanov's career, man. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody yeah. knows what the fuck is going on with the guy. He's Batman, bro. That's what it is. You can't tell everyone what's oh, happening. Shit. You have to keep yeah, it seriously. <laughs> Hiding in his lair. Exactly. But yeah, that's about it for that. Glowaski was on the undercard. He fought a guy that was level below him, um, an Argentine Italian dude, and he just got beat around for five rounds. And yeah, the fight got stopped, which was good because he was just taking a beating for no reason. And yeah, it was a week. WBSS uh, card, but we got two coming up, and hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll they'll go back to their recipe of uh, the last three we've had where they were exciting. And one props though that I think this is, you know, the first world heavyweight title fight held in Riga, Latvia, and the crowd was fucking awesome. I don't know if that came across to you, Neil, on on whatever feed you watched it, but. I think was it the last round where they didn't even hear the bell and they would continue to fight because the crowd was so loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the very last round. They continued to fight for about three or four seconds. Yeah. Till the ref was like, "No, wait, no, yo, chill, man, it's finished." <laughs> but yeah, props to. Uh, that was probably that was probably the to... best action in the fight. <laughs> it probably was. Yeah, it was probably the most fluid anyway, where they they got to actually land some shots. But yeah. I, I'm pretty much done on that card, Neota. If you've uh, if you've got anything else to add. Yeah, no, I'm finished with it. Now, I I know you're busy these days, so I I, I don't think you would watch much of this poor Liverpool Eddie Hearn matchroom card. Um, I I did see uh, Holland Butler. Uh, I I saw like bits and pieces of some of the other cards, um, or some of the other fights. So like, as you bring them up, I could probably uh, interject with uh, whatever um, I did see of them. All right, let's start at the top then. The rematch that no one requested, Paul Butler versus Stuart Hall. What did you think of that? Well, I mean, even though, like you know, like yeah, as you said, no one requested it. I mean, it was it was to to me these two guys are on a, a relatively like even level. You know, I did think that Hall could have uh, actually got the W against Haskins last time out. Um, you know, I thought that you know Butler had kind of taken a step back ever since he got you know wasted by um, by Zelan Tete. And, uh, you know, to, to me, the, this fight was a pretty solid, like, kind of a B-level bantamweight fight. You know, the guys just below the top level kind of trying to get back up there. And, um, you know, to me, to me, it's a solid fight. You know, these fights are kind of the bread and butter of boxing, really. You know, where you have two guys on an even level. They might not necessarily be the best of the best, but they're on an even enough level. So it's not like you're seeing a guy that's, that's like a contender fighting a straight-up scrub, and then he gets a title shot after that, which is the case with, I think... Most fighters, really, like in most divisions, you know, you you oftentimes get a guy that's like just below the top level, but he's not fighting another guy that's just below the top level. He's fighting some guy that has no fucking chance of beating him in the first place, and he beats him, and all of a sudden he has a title shot. But um, you know, be that as it may, uh, this fight was pretty good. Um, I thought the, the the action was pretty even early on until Butler started to kind of, I guess, find a, a bit of a rhythm and start kind of uh, jabbing, sticking, and moving, and everything. And um, Hall was just following him around too much. You know, he kind of followed Haskins around a little bit too much, but I thought he was able to cut off the ring a bit better against him. Um, here against Butler, uh, I think Butler was a little bit more open for him. But at the same time, Butler was also landing uh, a bit, I think, just cleaner, snappier shots on Hall, whereas Hall's were kind of those stunning shots a little bit 
uh, more few and far between in terms of like when he was able to actually finally set his feet and get him off. But, um, you know, Butler did a solid job. I thought the scores were a little bit wide uh, for Butler, but, um, you know, I still thought that he won the fight um, pretty clearly. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have been mad if they had been at least a little bit closer. But, you know, for what it's worth, you know, he got the he got the W, and I guess they're aiming at uh, Jamie McDonald next if McDonald's able to get past Solis, which is no guarantee because, honestly, I thought Solis kind of handed him his ass in the first fight. And I, don't, I really don't expect much to change in the second fight, especially considering the fact that McDonald has been having some issues making the weight. So if anything, uh, a slightly um, more uh, strained and drained McDonald against uh, a kind of a primed and, and a trim Solis, I, I think that benefits Solis a lot more. Uh, so, I mean, we'll see what happens. But, I mean, this was a pretty good fight um, as far as I'm concerned. You know, pretty good action all the way through. Relatively uh, even exchanges for the most part. Didn't necessarily pop off into an out- outright slugfest or anything like that. And Butler kind of had um, his – kind of had control of it for the most part. But I thought it was it was a solid view for the most part. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun fight. One-sided a bit, I thought, especially after the early rounds, Butler kind of took over. The last two, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, the fact that Hall was basically in Terminator mode and he was just coming looking for him, throwing a lot. But I don't understand why Hall didn't do that early run. I thought he let the fight slip away. Yeah. As you said, he, he didn't cut off the ring that well, but I thought Butler looked really good, man. W- one thing about Butler, and as I mentioned it when we talked about Clonello versus Golovkin, is... He's never there to get counted that often. Like if he throws a jab, he'll and, and he knows he's not going to throw anything else. He'll dip low, so he he can't get you know caught and shot back within the, with the, with a the jab. Uh, if he throws a hook, he always rolls under. He 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 never throws a hook without rolling, and it, and it's almost like muscle memory for him. But it's perfect because you're not there to get counted, man. You don't. He, he as Teddy says, he doesn't take a picture and stand there. He like he he, he throws a shot and he's gone. Um, partly probably because of his style, he's kind of in and out. He he never stands really in the pocket. He he comes in, does his work, gets out. Um, but yeah, I think he's fun to watch. He was doubling up on the left hook. The right hand was good, and the movement was really good. He's kind of keeping Stewie off balance a lot. Both left, right, lateral movement was really good and pretty fun fight. I've seen people on Twitter saying, oh, it was pretty boring and all that. Maybe because it was a bit one-sided, but I thought it was actually good for the for the, for the times they were exchanging. Unlike you, Nails, I thought the scorecards were okay. I had it 117-111, which was the same as one of the judges. Um, the other two had it, I think, one eighteen, one ten, right? Which, yeah, yeah, which I think basically they must have just give. Stew with the last two. I actually give him the last two and the third. I thought he landed a few clean shots and a nice uh, right hand near the end of the round, which kind of dazed, not dazed, but kind of caught the attention of Butler. Um, and so I give him that round. So, yeah, three rounds to uh, Hall, and the rest was easy work for Butler, I thought. But, yeah, okay. To your point about them looking for McDonald, I, to me, that's strange. I don't think that's a good style matchup for. For Butler, he's not. He's yeah. not. He's not. Uh, I, I think he's always going to struggle with kind of tall, rangy guys. You know, the same way they did with Tete, I think he would with McDonald also. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And the reason it is is because he's not a guy that's going to come forward and stand on your chest. That's not his style. Yeah, that, that style will do good against McDonald. Yeah, the, like the, way, the, the way that he dips is actually a liability against those taller, rangier guys because they can pretty much hit you at any range. So they don't even really have to overcommit themselves in order to touch you. Yep. So for them to be chasing him, I don't know. I think maybe him and Ryan Burnett, especially now that on the same uh, promotional um, team, I think them two would be a really good technical fight. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it would be too. Um, you know, that's that's pending if uh, Burnett's able to beat Zakianov, which I don't think is necessarily a guarantee. I favor him to win, but um, Zakianov is a pretty pretty brutal fighter himself. Uh, but. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of it is kind of surprising, but I'm imagining that you know he it's just Hearn trying to kind of do it in house style, and um, then hopefully I guess make that fight after the fact after they both have titles, and he can kind of capitalize on it more so than he otherwise could have. Yeah, but you know what's gonna happen? McDonald's like either beat Salise legit or another robbery, then he'd be like, I can't make the weight anymore, vacate the belt. He'll step up to you know super bunt him, and then I don't know fucking. But will fight someone for a vacant belt. That's like Hearn hates to make, you know, internal fights. So I bet you some shit like that will happen. 
Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could definitely see that. All right, undercar wise, start off with Fielding Brophy. You probably saw this nature. Although it... if he uh, wait a minute, he, if he vacates though, because McDonald only has the regular title, so the WBA may just do away with it. If he does, then because that's because good... that's what happened with Shumanov. Like yeah, you know, then after I after you just told me about that, um, they did away with it, and then Dortico's wound up getting being elevated to regular champion from interim. So hopefully that happens then, because I hate when Hearn yeah. gets these on a plate vacant title shots for his boxes right but I do like Butler though I liked him from his like front warren days man so um anything else to add to that um no that's that's about it oh you know Haskins is actually rated pretty highly on the WBA so I could see him him and Butler uh doing it for um you know a title shot or whatever I guess become the mandatory for the McDonald. I mean for the uh, Zakina uh, Burnett winner yeah that would be a decent fight to be honest Haskins versus yeah. Butler yeah, yeah, I think that's a bit more of like a kind of a skill technique technique matchup between those two. I think that's a, that's actually pretty intriguing. The, but they, you know, the way that they would kind of match up with each there's other. There's some good mix in the match in there, like Zach and I have against. Because because I, I think because I think Haskins is a little bit quicker than Butler, so I think Butler would be kind of forced on the front foot a bit more than he otherwise would would be. Haskins are quicker than Butler, you think? In what what letting off his shots or? Yeah. Nah, I disagree. Yeah, I, think, I, think, yeah. I think I think Butler's faster, man. You think so? Okay. Yeah. Maybe so. I, I, I've never liked Haskins style, man. That, never liked it. But um, you talk about Zach and I from mixing and matching, like him versus uh, McDonald. Like that would be hell for McDonald, just a guy that's come forward throwing punches, sitting on your chest. But him and Butler would be a great, you know, style matchup. Burnett versus McDonald would be great. Like if some of those fights gets made, man, I think there's some really high level um, bantamweight fights there. Yeah, 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 and, and ironically, that's not even uh, including some of the the higher level guys. Um, I guess you know it's got to be mentioned that Luis Neri he tested positive for what was that that steroid that um that's in like the the the, the cattle and all that stuff. Your boy's um, juicing, the, bro. The, w- <laughs> the the WBC still hasn't uh, decided exactly what they're gonna do. The ring uh, reinstated Shinsuke Yamanaka as their champ. The WBC hasn't uh, done anything yet. I guess they're in a kind of a tricky situation with him and with Luis Ortiz and exactly how they're going to follow things up with uh, their their clean boxing program. I think but, they're regretting um, starting that program. Yeah, yeah. It's it, and the thing that that's crazy about it is like with with regard to Neri, like honestly, like I think that the the um, contaminated meat thing is legit. Like you know because of the fact that. It's not even just um, in Mexico that they do that. They do that in the U.S. too. Like a lot of the the big meat manufacturers, they they fucking f- pump their cattle and their chickens full of steroids. And, uh, I think I know Tyson Foods used to do it. Um, they they stopped, I guess, like a couple of years ago because they like they they had some issue with um, their chickens like had grown extra feet or some shit. But <laughs> that, was, that was some pretty strange. Um, things, but I don't know. It's just it's it, when it's something is that widespread that like the entire food source of a, of a given nation or a given continent even is contaminated with something that could be banned. Um, I don't know. It just, it just seems like kind of a non-starter to to be to, to be doing that. But and then the the thing with Ortiz is kind of strange. I mean, we'll get to it later. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like the, with so, with some of those um, substances. They're a little bit too widespread. Like there should be, I guess, maybe like legal limits or something to them, uh, as opposed to banning them outright. Because, like the the unfortunate fact of the matter is, um, you know, a lot of our food and supplement products and all that stuff is contaminated. You know, at the end of the day, you know, even if you try to eat like organic food, uh, you know, the shit is oftentimes not organic because the GMO stuff will be pollinated by bees into non-GMO stuff. And then that turns a GMO, and then like I don't know if you've ever seen the the issues a lot of people have with Monsanto. Monsanto would actually like go and sue people's like sue like small farmers and stuff who are normally organic because they fed they were able to kind of figure out that um, their stuff had been contaminated with their uh, their copyrighted or trademarked fucking genetically modified stuff, and they were able to actually successfully sue them, which is crazy. But um, yeah, just the the the, con- the constant cross contamination of just the the world as a whole. Is, um, supply of food, water, etc., uh, is is uh, c- kind of a pretty dicey game when we're talking about um, clean testing and all that stuff. You know, especially considering the fact that 
so many athletes are constantly taking something, whether it's legal today or Ill- illegal tomorrow or what have you, um, in order to get some sort of an edge. So there, there has to be a certain uh, degree of, I think, uh, logical give in, in some in certain aspects. But um, I mean, I guess we could we could see how that how that winds up going. And I guess I'm going a little bit too long with this because now they're calling us the Agri Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> Branching out. That's right. Uh, you mentioned Yamanaka. Am I right in saying after the fight initially he announced his retirement? Do you know if he's going to come back or what's the situation? Um, well, the, it sounded like um, it was really be- pending what was going to happen with uh, with his title. So I'm not sure if he's – I'm not sure what he thinks specifically about the ring title since they already reinstated him. But it seemed largely it was going to be based off of whether they – Gave him the win back or or the um, the loss back or what have you with the, the WBC and whether they were going to reinstate his title as to whether he was going to continue. I guess um, from the sounds of it, if they're going to give him back his title and or like uh, like he, he he's basically said, I guess that he's open to rematching Neri. Um, you know whether as long as they give him back his title, basically as long as he gets his WBC title back, I think he's willing to continue. If they don't, then he's going to stand to his retirement. Um, and that's whether that's even if they give him back his time, they say, OK, well, you got to rematch Neri. And as long as he tests positive, I mean, test negative this time, uh, then then you have to fight him and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, to me, it seems like, you know, he's he's kind of willing to do it either way. So just as long as he's able to get back his title, because I think that, that is largely what meant a lot to him, because he was on the verge of actually breaking the, the Japanese record for uh, most title defenses held by Yoko Gushiken. So, um, you know, I think that, that that was a big deal to him and, you know, kind of making history domestically speaking, you know, on the world stage. So um, I guess we'll, we'll see exactly what the ruling comes down with the WBC. It'd be a real shame for uh, for Yamanaka to kind of go out like that. You know, it's it's, it's I mean, imagine being uh, this long standing champion, the longest standing champion in the sport. And then a guy on PEDS beats you, you know, beats you down and makes you look like a fool, <laughs> you know, the way that Neri kind of did. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's very disheartening. You know, it's, and I mean, just even the ring, the, the ring, they, they gave him back his title, but they still kept him out of his pound for pound placement. You know, I think it was rated like eight or nine or something pound for pound from the ring, but they removed him because they felt like, you know, other fighters had uh, done more recently in order to deserve a placement above him. So that, that kind of sucks for him as well, you know, cause it wasn't his fault that the guy tested positive or some shit. Yeah. Oh, it's weird of the ring then, because then why give the guys his belt back in the first place? It's a bit, it's a bit contradictive. Yeah. But yeah. Um, All right, going back to the Liverpool battle on the Mersey. Um, hopefully you might have seen it. It only lasted one round. Rocky Fielding versus David Brophy. You managed to catch um, it. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. No, I did. I did. You know, it's another kind of throwaway fight fight that really doesn't mean anything they, you know handling some of these guys with with uh, kid gloves and um i don't know man uh, bro i mean brophy had a good record coming into it but it was clear that he was way out of his depth um i mean i guess you can't say it was it was a terrible fight um i don't know maybe i'm being just over critical but uh i mean Phil things did a good job he, he went in there took him out I guess uh, maybe caught him cold and um, took up the trash. You know, Fielding should, I think, uh, be a, a bit above and beyond um, this level, though. I mean, even even if he had the loss to Smith, you know, he has uh, he has better opponents in the past uh, before this yeah. um, than 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 Bro- what Brophy was able to offer him. But you know, I guess it's kind of a rebuilding fight and uh, one against against a guy whose record looks you know relatively clean. So you know it was it was very um, sellable, but you know good a good win for Fielding, not a great win necessarily, but a good one, solid one. Um, so I can't uh, can't take too much away from it though. Yeah, I agree. Um, after that loss to Smith, he kind of went back rebuilt. Had a decent fight against Rob Brasse, a very poor fight against John Ryder, which was a stinker. So I think that's why he kind of wanted wanted to come out and actually entertain and look good, which he did. Brophy was weird though because when I was watching it live, I didn't really see the punch that hurt him because he, he kind of seemed stumble back and then shell up because he 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 looked injured, and then you know, mm-hmm. um, what's his name? Um, uh, feeling came in with barrage and kind of you know hurt him again, but 
when I looked on the replay, it didn't seem... Yeah, the, the left hook was kind of on top of the head, but it didn't, it didn't seem much power behind it. I was quite surprised that that shot really affected him so much. Right. Well, I mean, maybe maybe if he was injured, though, then you know he just didn't have balance under him. And sometimes, like, if you're almost like if you're up in the air, um, you know, shots that wouldn't otherwise normally hurt you or hurt you as bad can uh, do more damage otherwise. Yeah. But, yeah, I've not really got anything to add... On paper, yeah, it looked like a kind of 50-50 fight, especially after feelings like lackluster um, recent efforts. But And Brophy going over to Australia and winning that Commonwealth belt as well. But, yeah, he, he looked pretty shady, to be honest. Um, moving on, what else did we have? Did you see any bits of Sean Masha Dodd versus Thomas El Capitan Stoker? No, no, unfortunately, I was kind of busy at the, when, when that was going on. Yeah, it's classic boxer versus brawler and the boxer couldn't handle the brawler's pressure and you know constant output where Stoker came out he looked pretty good for the first two rounds he was, he was kind of boxing and moving having said that Dodd really didn't do anything for the first round I think he was just kind of eyeing him up seeing what he's got uh, towards the end of the first he'd kind of th- uh, put some pressure on throw some shots and Stoker just can't handle pressure man like, he'll go backwards with his hands low getting caught with stupid shots and like Sean Dodd's not fucking a world beater but if you're such a high level amateur, you were the captain of the of the British team, um you talk so highly of yourself, like he was saying like Dodd's not in his league and blah 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 beforehand and you put that type of performance on like I I don't you haven't really got much left in the game man. If you can't beat Sean Dodd at that level then you might as well just retire in my opinion, man. Like two rounds and all the judges had it the same, they had it one eighteen, one eleven, so basically they almost really give him the first two and then nothing after that and he, he looked like confused halfway through the fight like he didn't know what to do it's like you fought at such a high level you should be able to kind of adjust um and take and you know i'm putting a game plan which you, you're gonna be able to fucking follow man it was just really weird um but props to sean dudley he's he, he he's done well for himself. He's he's probably fighting at a level now where he didn't really um, see himself ever getting to. So he's getting decent paydays. Hopefully, I assume um, he sells quite a bit of tickets. So so props to him, man. He, it shows you, man. You can be an amateur and get the best uh, tuition and the best teams behind you, man. But hard work and dedication, sorry to quote Floyd, um, sometimes comes out better. So props to Sean Dodd. What else did we have, Neil? To Tom Farrell, undefeated, faced O'Hara Davis, the first fight he had since that Josh Taylor loss. And uh, I think Farrell's undefeated record um, made people think this was going to be a, a closer fight than it was, but it was basically a mismatch. Did you manage to catch this? Yeah, he was, fight- he was fighting the legend, man. Awara Davies. Awara. Awara. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I caught, I caught a little little bits of it. You know, I wanted to see how um, Davies was going to come back, and uh, he did. You know, he did fairly well. He did uh, did did a number on uh, undefeated opponent. I mean, for what it's worth, and uh, you know, even though Taylor beat him, you know, Taylor I think um, has kind of proven uh, to everybody that that's seen him fight and saw the fight against Davies. You know, he was you know he's kind of a I don't want to say like a special fighter as in terms of like being like an elite fighter yet. Not quite there yet. You know, he hasn't proven that much yet but um he's a very high level operator and uh you know he was just a bit too much for davies in, in that fight um and davies you know he he's still a guy with um good reflexes you know good power on those reflexes good snap on the shots and you know if he's going to catch you with that you know you, you're you're going to be in trouble you're going to be in trouble and that's exactly what happened with Farrell. um took him out and um you know davies is a, is a guy that has managed to get um, a good degree of fanfare around himself in spite of not necessarily having um, the wins to back it up. But, uh, you know, he's, I think, um, at the end of, uh, of their careers, we may look back on uh, on Taylor's win over Davies as kind of not only uh, kind of a big spring for, for Taylor, but um, something that kind of got Davies in gear and managed to, to get him um, to fight uh slightly better than people would have otherwise thought for a guy like him. You know, I think there there might be people that think that he was just going to fall up, fall to pieces afterwards, but I think he'll, he'll rack up some pretty solid wins, you know, even if it not, might not necessarily be against the best guys. And basically I don't think that the story is completely done with him. You know, I, I expect him to see him to, I expect to see him in another uh, pretty legit fight, whether it's on the, the world stage or slightly below that um, at some point in the future. 
Yeah, you said it all, Neil. To um, one sided, I thought Ahara looked decent. He, after he hurt him and dropped him with that kind of one two and that long backhand. Um, yeah, you, you kind of saw that the writing was on the wall. I think he kind of kind of went after that punch a bit too much. He was kind of constantly throwing it. Uh, I thought he could have mixed it up with the left hook, but. That referee, man, I think that fight could have been stopped a bit earlier, man. That, that dude took a bit of an unneeded punishment towards the end. I, it, really, his corner should have pulled him out. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't think how they were, he was going to turn it around after that really poor start. So, pull the kid out, man. He's young. He can come back. But why are you giving, letting him take this extra beating? Really bad. Right. Yeah, man. And, you know, against somebody like, like Davies, I think that's kind of dangerous, too. Because, you know, he, he, it's like he has that power to hurt you, but not necessarily take you out right then and there. So, you know, that, that's where it can get kind of dicey. Yeah, because if you're just taking constant big shots rather than one big shot and, and you're out and you and you, at least you're not taking more, but just constant big yeah. shots just can have a really bad effect on you. But, yeah, so Ahara, rebuilt, and let's see where he goes. I think 140 is interesting in the UK still. Obviously, Josh beat him, but going kind of European and, and fringe world, I think there's decent fights out for him because it's kind of... 140s at a kind of transition period, so... Um, yeah, it's a division in flux, you know, and event- eventually it'll kind of, uh, you know, the waxing and waning period, it'll, it'll go back to waxing probably in a couple of years, and it'll be hot again. Definitely. Moving on, what else did we see? Chizora was there, looking fat, fighting a guy that was even fat. I didn't watch that. Um, Natasha Jonas, I did watch her. She fought uh, a, a woman that I saw of her live actually she fought Chantal Cameron in Glasgow when I saw that fight with the uh, with Lim and Kimo and uh, Natasha looked better than she did on her debut I thought the 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 Southpaw straight was landing pretty decent she was throwing it as a lead and um, yeah she looked alright man um, she's not one of my favourite fucking female fighters out there but she's okay to watch man I don't really got anything else to say Anthony Fowler I don't like him as a kind of person. His attitude's a bit weird, but probably the first fight I've seen him as a pro that he didn't look too bad, man. Uh, he was using the the jab systematically. He used it really well, I thought, um, and then adjusted to the body and um, managed to get Jay Burn out of there because he's kind of high guard going backwards, taking a lot of shots on the arms and the gloves. And once he started going to the body, Fowler, then um, yeah, Burn just couldn't take those body shots. So. That was um, a good adjustment for Fowler. And that's right. Yeah, really, Neil, too. I think we've kind of gone through that card. I think we've spent more time on it than it actually deserved. But, yeah, I'm done there. Did you see anything else uh, this weekend? I know there was a card in the US. I think Spike O'Sullivan was on it, but I didn't really bother trying to find that shit. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't care about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't care about Spike O'Sullivan. Didn't really before. Um, you bank and I definitely didn't afterwards yeah so um, let's talk some news then Nilta what have I wrote down main one obviously you mentioned it earlier we were talking about substances is uh, Wilder and this OT situation and I joked the other day with some of you guys that Heyman just keeps drugging up Wilder's opponent so we don't have to fight anyone uh, with a pulse you know ironically though um even though I'm not like the, the conspiracy type, I could see a situation where it's almost like the middle ground between, you know, drugging opponents and not, whereby they knew that Ortiz, like they had like an inside information that Ortiz was doing something, you know, that was illegal for the, for the VADA clean testing program. And, um, and so then they, that's, they signed the fight kind of knowing that, knowing that he would test positive. And then of course, you know, he did it just as planned. Um, I mean, that said, the, what he tested positive for and then them trying to put up the excuse that like, oh, like it's a uh, high blood, sh- blood pressure medication. Well, if you're on high blood pressure medication, what the fuck are you doing medically cleared the box in the first place? That's first of all. Secondly, you know, that it, the, the substances in that high blood pressure medication, chlorothiazide and hydrochlorothiazide, they're both banned diuretics. That's the reason why, you know, that, that he tested positive in the first place. Um, what are you, ta- what else are you taking that's raising your blood pressure that highly? Is it some sort of other banned stimulant or steroids, which can, you know, both of those things can raise your blood pressure acutely, um, to a dangerous level. Um, and then, and then, you know, so, I mean, on both sides of it, it just looks fishy, you know, whether it was, oh, he is legit taking high blood pressure medication. Well, why? 
you know, is it because he's taking some other shit that's that's all also banned, or you know, otherwise, is he even healthy enough to be able to uh, be allowed to box, or is he gonna go in there get knocked out and then we have a some sort of like critical care situation where he winds up getting rushed to the hospital afterwards, or or shit, even if he's the winner. I mean, I remember. Um, who was that dude that Kimbo Slice was fighting and the both of them like needed to get taken to the hospital afterwards and then Kimbo died and <laughs> the other guy was like like all fucked up still and, yeah it was crazy man um, yeah Ortiz Ortiz fucked it up um, it's really it's really kind of uh, dismaying to to see something like that happen you know with another Wilder opponent and you know it's it's unfortunate man cuz like i really want to see wilder tested you know i'm i'm somebody that's been a supporter of his for a long time and i really want to see the guy tested and against you know the the truly best guys against a guy you know somebody that has like some danger of knocking him out but it seems like it's pretty much not destined to happen until he fights somebody like an Anthony Joshua with that with that name value yeah. Um, and then as for Ortiz, you mean I, I like I'm somebody also that wanted to see him get a shot. You know, he he legit to me, you know, he is one of the best heavyweights out there and deserves to be fighting against the other best heavyweights. And, you know, he gets his opportunity and then it, it, he fucks it up, you know, by either not having a therapeutic use exemption for that. Where if I mean, if if your blood pressure is like slightly high, I mean, I'm sure they'd allow you to box, but not to, a, you know, it, it's a there's a certain level there's a certain threshold where it crosses probably where they wouldn't clear you at all. Um, so if that, if this was a, like a known issue that he's had, then he should have had a therapeutic use exemption for it. And, you know, that should have been um, put out there from the jump and, you know, it, should, it shouldn't have been an issue. It should have been them tweeting afterwards like, oh, no, this is his therapeutic use exemption, not, oh, here's a fucking bottle that his doctor has, has uh, mandated that he take, you know, so – it's bullshit all, all the way around so it's 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 irritating frustrating but you know this is this is heavyweight boxing at its finest it seems Naota, if you're a boxer you've been caught before if you're taking any medication whether it be um something prescribed by your doctor just send it to him and say look i'm taking this right. or I, I i've been told to take this is it okay how fucking yeah, hard no, is exactly. that to do yeah, and and with Vada, they've even said in the past, if you're taking, if you want to take any particular supplement or whatever, you can actually send them a, some of it, and they'll test it for you and tell you whether or not there's anything banned in there, whether it's been contaminated with some shit, because a lot of those pre workouts and stuff actually do have banned substances in it, and it's not that it's oh it's been accidentally contaminated. No, they do that on purpose because they know that most of the shit that they put in those supplements doesn't work worth a damn. So they they actually do put steroids and shit like that in it in order to to make their stuff work and to to get results for people so that they keep buying it again. Um, so you know, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very simple way to do it. You know, the most of these fighters that are on this clean boxing program that are fighting for world titles aren't poor, so it, it shouldn't be it should be very kind of rudimentary for them to be able to send a sample, you know, for a few bucks um to 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 vada or whoever if you're in the, the the clean boxing program really that it should probably be all be able to be handled by them by vada themselves um and then uh at that point you know you know 100 percent for sure whether or not you're taking anything that could give you a false positive or what have you i always try and give people the benefit of the doubt and you know try and see the best in people but if you've made a mistake once then okay if it's a genuine mistake, even if it's not, and you've been, you know, handed a ban or a big fine, and you get the chance to fight again, or you know, uh, go into a sport again, maybe it's athletics or whatever. Um, but a second time now, man, like that's on you now. You you should get a ban from the sport because boxing, man, you're punching motherfuckers in the face, man. Like, you can kill people, so whether it's something that's going to give you... I don't really believe, like, a lot of substances are going to give you more power. Maybe they might give you more stamina, etc. But if you're taking something that they've obviously told you that's um, banned, then that's on you, man. Like, you you should be, you know, banned for life from that sport. Well, like, I, th- I think there's something to be said for... I think some like from what I've um, heard from people that have taken you know supplements like that, like a lot of the times it it almost like 
you know the the idea of the zone like when you're in the zone in 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 a sporting event whether it's you know boxing or basketball or whatever when you're in that zone and you're like you like kind of feel like the, at the peak of your powers where it's like you feel like you know you can run that little bit faster you you react that little bit quicker you feel that little bit stronger yeah um i'd be willing to bet that a lot of these supplements they'll put you in that zone quicker and for a longer degree and so if you're in that zone artificially for for that much time almost like that heightened sense of like adrenaline rush that that you could get you know like like some people get like say if a mother has their kid under a car or something they fucking lift a car just because of the adrenaline rush that it provides them or whatever you know that like you that can legitimately be dangerous it can make you potentially punch harder and and punch faster and hit harder for longer and things like that so you know it can it can be a, a bit of a situation where you're looking at you know a, a criminal act in that case but um you know i'm i'm of the the uh, the opinion that you know fighters and, and athletes in general they're always trying to get the edge regardless of whether they're um on the verge of breaking rules or are actually knowingly breaking rules um so i don't know it's kind of, it's kind of a hero their situation so while i i don't feel like um Ortiz was necessarily at least like this medication probably didn't you know make it so that like oh all of a sudden he's like some fucking uber god of boxing uh it's still uh, something where he could have been taking something else that that could have been given him like an illegal advantage that he really ne- shouldn't necessarily have um you know that so in general I, to me it's like either either all or nothing you know like either um, you're going to go hard on everybody and if they, they're testing positive for something like one or two strikes or three strikes you're out or whatever um, or don't bother even testing at all and just to do the, the post fight you know piss test or whatever and that'll be enough you know because at the end of the day you know unless you're testing somebody every single day randomly at a random time every single day you're never going to be 100% sure that nobody is that nobody's on some sort of drug because there are um, turnover times that could, you know, something your system could be flushed within a few hours, you know, within a few hours even. So, you know, unless the, you're, you're testing somebody like at 10 p.m. one day and then at 7 a.m. the next day and then at 2 a.m. the next day and then at 5 p.m. the next day and you're able to do that every single day, 365 days a year, which nobody's doing, um, then you're never going to be 100 percent sure that nobody's on something. Totally agree. Um, anything more to add about Ortiz and his PED use? Um, just it's unfortunate, man. You know, because I think uh, PEDs or no PEDs, the guy's a talented fighter, and so it's a it it sucks to um, get have a guy not be active and not being able to prove himself um, um, on a, either side of it. Uh, you know, just t- it takes another name, another strong fighter out of the division. You know, in a division that's otherwise kind of you know top heavy, and um, I-, I think something where good fights can be made, but they're they're not they're not yeah. getting made. Wilder so. said that he still continues to want to fight on that date, with it being heavyweights, and they're not restricted to you know getting down to a weight. At short notice, who would you like as a short notice opponent? I know Miller was on the undercard, well, supposed to be on the undercard, so I'd love that fight. Dillian White's yeah. talking a lot of smack. I won't mind the Dillian White Wilder fight. Yeah, yeah. It seems like from Wilder's camp, they're, they're not really too uh, hot on either of those options. I'd love those two fights, man. Those those would be great. You know, the, the, the both of those guys are very sellable. They sell themselves and everything. Um, I think Miller, especially, actually is a is a reasonably tough fight for Wilder. You know, he's kind of a big, tough guy, a strong guy, a guy that would kind of force Wilder really on the back foot. Wilder would really have to make his power count a lot more, the count, the power and the distance. Um, White, um, to a certain degree, a little bit less so. Um, but still, I think he would make a good fight of it. You know, he'd, he'd have a good go of it. Um, and, you know, if anything, he would go down swinging. Um, so I like those fights. Um, shit, I, I even think Dominic Brazil. Hey, throw, throw the grudge match in there, man. Just because Brazil got taken out by Joshua, I mean, he, he proved against a um, guy whose name I'm forgetting now, a uh, guy from, uh, what was it, Nigeria, that, that he knocked out. Uh, that You know, he's no joke. He can hit. He can legit crack. And so if he if he touches you, the, um, you could be in some serious danger. You know, let's let's uh, let's have um, Wilder fight some of these guys that look like a legit danger to him, and uh, and see see what happens on, on the way out. You know, it's like last minute opponents last minute opponents don't have to be utter trash. 
you know, especially with with this much notice. I think there's guys that are, you know, relatively in shape that are preparing for fights coming up that um that could be, you know, decent opponents for him. Yeah, my bad. I'm getting mixed up. It's uh, Bermain Stavern that's on the undercard, so I think they may be looking at the rematch for that. But Miller, I'm, I'm getting mixed up. He's on the undercard of, uh, I think, the Daniel Jacobs' Arias fight on the length of November. So my bad. He's fighting uh, Marius Wack on the undercard, so just got mixed yeah. up a bit. But yeah, he... yeah, the, yeah. Another another guy, Bermain Stavern, that can't fucking be bothered to not test positive for all kinds of shit. <laughs> Yep, unfortunately. Like, I don't know. Maybe maybe he had contaminated spaghetti, contaminated <laughs> red meat sauce. <laughs> ah shit! You need to watch where you're buying spaghetti from, man. It's got all type of shit in there. Um, all right, let's move on. In the states, me and Kimo were having conversations before this fight got announced, and we were like, "Shit, it's gone quiet, man." A few months ago, they were talking about Rigo and Loma, and is it because you know they can't really get the contractual? agreement the, you know the, the arguing little points and then it got announced and we thought oh it must have just went quiet just because they were just fine tuning um, the contract so you know, I can't wait for this Nilta but my question to you is like is this a win win fight for you because whoever wins and whoever loses like are, are you happy or is this a, is it a win win if both guys just knock each other out and make or make a really <laughs> sloppy fight like how, how do you want this fight to play out no, nah, honestly, it's a lose lose to me because I mean, either way, people are gonna overrate the win. Um, I mean, uh, really, uh, for for Rigandau, it's it's kind of a no lose situation because I mean, if he loses, he kind of was supposed to, you know, he was he's the smaller guy moving up in weight, um, kind of conceding stuff to Lomachenko. He's on the older side, um, so I mean, with that, I mean, there, there's still a lot to sell. Whenever you're moving up in weight, you can always at least um, have the excuse like, "Oh, the other guy was too big for me. I was too small for weight," etc. Um, with with Lomachenko, if he loses, I mean, it's it's kind of a it's it's a bit of a disaster for him to be honest with you. Um, you know, especially considering how much he's the guy's been overhyped. Um, I'm mean, honestly like I I could really care less how it plays out. I'm I'm not particularly a fan of either guy. Um, both guys have have been you know avoiding certain fighters in their weight classes, and uh, so it is what it is. They're fighting each other now, so at least um, in, in a certain way, it, it, it's a lose-lose, but also a win-win where I might be able to be rid of one of them unless it turns out to be like a draw or some shit, in, in which case it's, it just becomes more irritation from the two most disgustingly stupid fucking fan bases in boxing. You said that Loma's been avoiding people. I think it would be opposite. I think people have not wanted to fight him. Uh, but, well, I mean, Ber- Berchelt, he he avoided Berchelt. He basically told him to kick rocks that just because he was the mandatory didn't mean that he he got a mandated shot of the WBO belt, so he went over and fought Vargas instead. And then, you know, the Salido situation where, I mean, they're trying to give a guy all, an offer while he's injured and shit like that. And, um, you know, them and HBO basically, like, uh, avoiding even uh, acknowledging the existence of Jezreel Corrales, even though he beat the number one guy at the weight. You know, so there you go. The Salido situation, he he wasn't injured. He was just getting really good Uber money at that time, so he didn't want to turn it down. That's... Yeah, it may be, man. You know those uh, those surge prices, those, those things. You know they they can really uh, they can really make you make a good payday. You know I'm sure that he's uh, that he's chilling. You know probably shadow boxing, shadow boxing on the sidewalk, and while he's waiting for his fares to come through. Yeah, and I think he's probably driving for Lyft now as well, so he's got the best of both worlds. Oh man, that's what's up. Getting money off everybody. That's now, right, I, man. I, I'm that, f- that double hustle. I'm looking forward to it, man. I think I, I think it's going to be a technical fight. Very. I don't think the output's going to be that high. Um, I think it'll be like early stages well, of I Salido. Think fa- I think it would favor Lomachenko to make the output high because Regan now doesn't doesn't like to uh, throw a lot of punches. He likes to really take his time. You know what I mean? He's he's a guy that he'll set his feet. If the if the the punch is there, he'll throw. If it's not, he'll try and you know try to move over to the side and kind of reset himself. Uh, I think high volume guys are the guys that, for, you know, primarily he's he's kind of avoided fighting and uh, the people that would pretty much give him the most trouble. So um, Lomachenko, if he goes in there with more of like kind of high volume style, if he pressures him, not unlike the way that he did uh, with Mariaga, especially in in this last fight. Um, you know, I think I think he could actually make the fight relatively easy on himself. You know, combined with uh, Rickendall's kind of, you know, iffy chin, at the very least. Um, you know, 
honestly, I think he could make it easy on him. So if he if he's trying to outbox uh, Rigano on the back foot, I think that's that's actually a bad strategy because it'll allow Guillermo to get into a, a bit better of a rhythm and really make the rounds a lot closer than they otherwise um, could or probably should be. Yeah, I think he'll be he'll be kind of uh, methodical. Like, like he'll start off slow, like he did against Salido, like he did against Gary Russell, and I think. I don't want to quote Kimo wrong, but from what I remember what he was saying in Vegas, he thinks that, you know, Loma's going to do all that flashy shit and then he's going to get caught with a nice uh, southpaw counter from Rigo. And I don't think he will do that flashy shit. I think he'll be on point. And, um, yeah, I, think, I, I don't think he will either. You know, right. I th- I, and I think, if anything, the Mariaga fight might have been good for him because he was trying to do some of that flashy shit and he paid for it. And then he stopped doing it and then he got the victory and knocked him out. So... You know, I think uh, at the very least that might have been a slight learning experience that was good for him. Um, okay, let's move on. What else have we got that I wrote down here? Hey, Bellew 2 got announced. Uh, I'm done with this shit. Like, <laughs> it's crazy, man. My, my, this is a fight that nobody, that, well, that nobody should want, really. Like, honestly, I mean, Hey is. I don't think the guy's healthy, man. The guy, the guy is gonna be looking like Sergio Martinez against Cotto in there. I, I think. I think Bellu's gonna knock him out quicker this time. Yeah, the turnaround's just too, too, too quick. I think. When was the first one fight? Was it March? And for rehabilitation, and then I think he needs to drop a bit of weight. I think he was too big for the first fight. He kind of lacked his speed. He looked quite cumbersome and. I think he needs to drop weight and do that within rehabilitation and start a camp. And yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I can't see it happening, man. Um, fingers yeah. crossed. I want Belly to be iced, but uh, <laughs> he's just he's, yeah. he's he's just too fragile now, especially with his, his age. His, and he's all not his the injuries. man for the job, man. If you want to see Belly be iced, I think you got to see him against some of the WBSS guys for that to happen. I think I think Hay is pretty much done, man. He's his goose is cooked. Um, when you have an injury like that, your freaking Achilles, man. Like, I don't see how how you could really box at a at a high level with something like that. Yeah, no, I think I think he's he was embarrassed by the first fight, and I think it's just a money grab. He thinks, well, the first fight was popular. We'll do it again, make a lot more money. And I, I do think maybe Hay thinks he might be able to catch him, but he looked so poor in the first fight, man. And the shots that he did land on Bellu, man, fucking Bellu took him quite well, man. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the thing is, hey, his a little bit slower. Those shots are, I think, more telegraphed than they used to be. And when they're more telegraphed, you can brace for them better. So you know, where some sometimes speed comes from from our excuse me, sometimes power comes from speed. Yeah. And just the snap and the the suddenness of a shot is what really hurts a guy. I don't think Hay is necessarily that that you know thudding like knockout artist where even if he hits you you know with a grazing blow like you feel it and you're like oh damn you know uh, i think he's one of those guys that really kind of knocked guys out from the speed and the snap that he had on his shots more so than anything and um, now that that's kind of dissipated al- along with the fact that he can't necessarily balance and, and uh, leverage those shots as well as he used to um you know the speed the the leverage and everything has, has kind of gone away so i think uh, the, the shots just aren't as effective anymore and so i think Bellu, um even with hey Possibly being in better shape than he was for the last fight, still would it really is is not going to have a great chance in it, and uh, I think Belly is going to take him out again. Unfortunately, I think you're correct, man. Even though I don't want Belly to win, but and and he's going to duck all the cruises, man. He'll probably look for another big fight at heavyweight, and then uh, if he yeah. gets I still just retire because he's made decent money, man. Uh, he's earned with her and paid his mortgage off, so. Um, yeah, we mentioned Josh Taylor earlier. Nilto, he's fighting Miguel Vasquez, man. I, I don't like that fight, man. I think it's a bit of a backward step after that O'Hara fight. That kind of it, it was on uh, free to air TV over here, Channel Five. It was hyped up. Um, it, it was a decent fight. It was a good ending. There was a lot of um, you know beef before the fight. A lot of shit talk by both guys. And I don't know, Vasquez, man. I like, it's it, he, he's rarely in there. A eye catching fight or a or a you know a, a fight he's where a spoiler. He, yeah he's a spoiler so it's like it's it's really weird matchmaking for me yeah yeah it's, I mean it's it's kind of dangerous too I mean he Vasquez could make him look like shit or he could beat him or you know or beat him quote unquote and then get a get robbed on the scorecards but I mean either way like it might not be a good look for for Taylor you know fighting a guy with a, a kind of herky jerky kind of hit and then you know clinch a lot too you know and move around a lot and everything style um i don't know it's it's a weird it's a weird fight uh taylor will probably win whether he deserves it or not 
Um, and if he if he beats uh, Vasquez, you know, clearly and or you know knocks him out or something, you know, that would definitely make a statement. But um, it's such a it's such a terrible style to fight that it's no wonder why none of the, the top fighters at, at 135 or 140 the last few years have really been wanting to fight Vasquez in the first place. So, yeah, I could actually um, see him again, just like icing him, like shots to the body, bre- breaking him down, but. It's kind of risk reward. Like if you ice Vasquez, people are gonna say, "Oh well, he's kind of old now. He's he's a bit short." And it's like lose lose yeah. almost. Like what what are you yeah. gaining from or, this? Or or they never rated Vasquez to begin with because they just don't like his style. Exactly. I so please lose lose. But yeah. for news, Neil, so that's kind of me done. Have you got anything you want to talk about? Um. Well, I guess uh, German Ancas is gonna be fighting uh, Jamie Conlon. Uh, coming up here, November was it November eighteenth? Is it is that on the? It's on the, on the same card. It's on the Frampton undercard, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what I thought. Yeah, um, yeah. That's a that's a good fight, man. That's a good that's a good fight. Um, I think Ancaz is gonna smoke Conlon, but I think Conlon, or at least you know, there there'll be some some good give and take a little bit here and there. Um, Ancaz isn't quite um, used to a guy kind of pressing him. Uh, at a high level you know he's been kind of fighting more kind of back foot boxers which i think has played into his hands in, in large part because he's kind of a you know he he's not unlike a pacquiao you know he's kind of an in and out shooting kind of explosive type fighter so a guy pressing him may um, bring some more um dimensions out of on um and relating to that uh now you, you know he's having trouble finding an opponent and you know I'm, i said it before and i'll say it again I want to see Inoue against Quadras. You know, if the if the other champs aren't available because Ancaz is fighting Conlon, and because I guess um you, you know your fight has the Ishida fight coming up, and then uh, Chuck Latito's aiming at Ishida, um you know shit fight Quadras man because because I mean the, the other guys you know Rex Cho is there's no way in hell that Aram's gonna sell Rex Cho out to fight um, Inoue without Rex Cho being an, a champion himself. You know, there's too much money to be lost there in the Hong Kong and Chinese market and everything. Um, it's looking like the, the most likely opponents for Inoue are Brian Valoya, Rashid Warren, and Jonas Sultan. You know, Sultan just had the big win over uh, Gianrio Casimero, uh, but he's probably going to sit on his title shot that he's going to be mandated for against Ancaz himself. And, um, you know, Valoya, he's a guy that, you know, we, we've seen him lose recently. And like Chocolatito, he is not a, a 115 pounder. He's not a super flyweight. Really, I think he's still probably one of the best flyweights in the world. He really should be still going after a belt there. Um, Warren's a good fight. Warren, I, I like the Warren fight. Um, if he if he if he takes that one, um, you know, a reasonably dangerous fight too. You, you got Go a soft spot for Rishi Warren, don't you? Well, I mean, he's a good fighter, honestly. I mean, the, he lost to Zakianov, and he was fighting at a weight that I think was too high for him to begin with. So I think. I think he's kind of better than he gets credit for. I hate um, all that shaking. If, I hate all that shaking his head shit, man. I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't really like it either. But the, I mean, the fact of the matter is, he's still a high level guy, and he's still reasonably effective. Um, so, I mean, if Inoue beats him, uh, and if he shit, if he beats him more conclusively than either Payano or Zakianov did at Bantamweight, then I mean that that just kind of props Inoue up even further, and, and kind of uh, shows and proves uh, just how good the guy is to begin with. Um, so, I mean, I like those fights. Uh, I, I like Warren as a, a backup from Quadras. Um, Valoria, I think, is really more of like a back corner fight. Like, if all else fails, I guess he could fight him. Um, you know, that's the guy that HBO was wanting him to fight, I guess, so that, you know, it's a bit more of a guaranteed win, but also against a big name, a name that people are familiar with. You know, Valoria has been around for such a long time. You know, he's, he was a world champion all the way back as far as, I think, 2005. Um, you know, and you know he he lost against Chocolatito recently on the on a big stage where you know he he hurt uh, Gonzalez in a couple of uh, different um, senses and uh, you know eventually got taken out though. Um, but you know the big name opponent, so the, the name value would be there, um, and it'd be a good build up, I guess, for eventually fighting Gonzalez himself, as Gonzalez has been keen to try to do, even still, yeah, um, you know, after getting knocked out. Or um, Suiza Kett versus Estrada winner, which uh, which should be just a you know solid build up, solid build up for 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 all involved basically. But um, yeah, I mean I'm I'm hoping that uh, quite they could get honestly there's no there's no reason why they couldn't get Quadras in there. Quadras deserves another shot at anybody out there because he's still one of the top guys at 115. We need a World Boxing Super Series at Superfly, man. That would be the shit. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be excellent. Um, I Hard read. Division. I read that Chuckles kind of eyeing up Carl Yaffai if he gets past um, Ishida. You, you read anything about that? Or? 
Yeah, no, no. I mentioned that. I mentioned that. That's that seems like uh, the the plan that they're they're kind of going with. Um, he said that he wants to have uh, he wants to get Yafai in there next to try and get the get another title, um, and or fight um, Inoue after that. That's that's what where, where Chuckles going. Oh no, with no, it. you so, confused I mean, me because you you said that Chuckles eyeing up Ashida, so then that's why he threw me off. Oh, my bad, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant I meant your fight. I meant your fight. Oh, okay, but because I've read that you know after the success of the first Superfly, they're looking at Superfly two. So if some of these right. matches can be made, man, like that Superfly two card would be looking very juicy as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Um, I'm trying to think. There was something. In my mind just before this. I'm trying to bring it back up here. It's alright, if it comes back to you then we can mention it at the end of the show. Oh yeah, Golovkin and Canelo, I guess the they 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 were trying to like mandate a rematch. I, I think it was the WBC, right? That was trying to mandate that? I'm not sure I've not read anything. Yeah, um I mean <sighs> I'm not sure how much how much sway they really hold, considering Canelo has kind of been flipping them off recently. Uh, so I'm kind of here or there about um, whether it actually will happen. But to me, like I'd I'd like the rematch. You know, to, uh, it, like like we had kind of said before, um, it was like a firework that didn't quite explode. And yeah. I think possibly in a rematch, uh, I think they, the both of them might let a little bit more hang out to try and uh, quell all doubts. On both sides, so um, really, I think I think a rematch would probably be better than the first fight was. I think it'd be better for Canelo. I think he'd probably look even better when at first. I was talking to my friend Scorsese yesterday, and we were saying that if anything, I think he's going to come out of the fight more confident. He went in there with Golovkin. He took his shots. He was competitive. He was landing clean. Like he's going to go into the rematch even more confident. Yeah, no, that that's true. But I mean, hey, if he is, then then so be it. And if he's more confident, then we should see some better exchanges then, because he, I, I'd imagine that then he'd be a bit more willing to, uh, to let it let the let the leather fly. You know, he's certain, not confident about his, uh, his stamina though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's, that's one the thing he's not today. confident on. But yeah, man, let's hope it yeah. just gets made again. And I don't think I'll be going to the rematch. I said to my wife now, I think I need to chill with the. <laughs> with these uh, with these boxing trips, but I'll uh, happily and gladly watch it from uh, my sofa, and fingers crossed it happens and it's a good fight. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a solid fight still. I mean, regardless of uh, any of uh, the, the the BS that kind of come before it, and maybe even since, um, it's a good fight, and I think um, there, there's definitely room to improve for both guys. Yep. Anything else? Um. No. I mean, I'm kind of drawing a blank now. Yeah, there wasn't really many, many things that were talked about or announced this week. So let's just go into the previews again. A bit like this week, a bit quiet. Not many high level, um, high level fights really. When is, have you noticed, Naoto? When there's like no boxing in the US, then it's like kind of a dead weekend, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of strange because then, like, when there is like a big card, all of a sudden there's big cards all over the planet. And there'll be a big card in the Philippines and a big card in the UK and a big card in Thailand or something <laughs> all at the same time. It's it's kind of strange how how that kind of works out. Um, yeah, go figure. Yeah. All right, let's start off in my hometown, Manchester, Crawler Burns. It's, it's, just a sh- it's just a fight between two shot guys, really, isn't it? Like, what, what more can we say? I, I'm favoring Crawler, but... <laughs> It, it it probably won't even be a good fight to be honest. Both guys, stylistically, you know, Crawler with the high guard, he always tries to kind of come on stronger and hopefully that his opponent wears down. But Ricky Burns has been twelve rounds so many times. He's, that that tactic's not going to work against Burns. So uh, I don't know. I don't really have much to say on this fight, Neilto. I mean, crossroads fight against, or excuse me, between two old fighters. Um... I don't know sometimes sometimes uh, these t- turn out to be kind of hidden gems, you know, when when they actually get in the ring and they start throwing the throwing the hands. But uh, I mean, I guess we'll see. You know, it's it's at the very least, I'd say it's a reasonably kind of uh, even level fight in in certain respects. Uh, you know, Burns may be further past it than than Krola is, 
Um, you know, Corolla was just recently, you know, kind of in contention and everything. But uh, I don't know. You know, Corolla, I think, took uh, worse beatings recently than, than Burns. So um, we may get some kind of Gaddy Ward action, possibly. Or some, uh, I'm trying to think, what was that fight? Um, Gio versus, uh, who was the guy from the UK that Gio fought? Barker. Can't think of his name. Barker. There you go. Maybe some Gil Barker action, you know? Uh... I think you've been positive. I'm I'm, I'm glad you're being positive, but I I can't really see that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, maybe not, maybe not. Um, Undercard-wise, awful as usual with um, Hearn these days. Sam Eggington's fighting Mohamed Minimum, some French dude. Um, I watched a bit of him before. Um, He looked quite small, man. We know Eggington's quite big for the weight. Um, What what have they got him as? Have they got his height? No, they haven't got his height on box rep. But he, the opponent, what? Either him and his opponent are both, um, you know, average height. And, and but I, I, I just thought he looked quite small for that for the weight. Um, but who knows? He, he's okay. But I, I don't think he really should cause Eggington's issues. Kind of a wide stance, kind of block, uh, classic kind of uh, uh, boxer. Um, so shouldn't really cause Eggington issues. So I don't know. Apart from that. What else we got? Scotty Cardles on there fighting TBA. Connor Benz fighting Nathan Clark in a six rounder five one and one. Um, that's about it. Jose Burton's in a six rounder. Classic shitty Hearn undercard. Um, and what else have we got that weekend? Uh, not a bad fight, Nelta. World Boxing Super Series. It's in, um, it's in Stuttgart, which is weird because I was thinking, well. Eubank Jr. is not from Stuttgart. I looked at Yildirim. He's Turkish and he still lives in Turkey. So I don't know if he's... He, he trains in... Um, he trains in Stuttgart when he, he has a camp. But I think it's just a situation where Sauerland and the World Boxing uh, Super Series team have got this card with Jamie Cox versus um, George Groves a week later. And in, in theory, they should have just put the, that fight with this Yidrim versus Eubank fight on the same card. But they obviously wanted to milk it a bit. Uh, they've put this fight in Germany and put it on pay-per-view for the people in the UK. Uh, put the Groves fight a week later on pay-per-view just to try and milk that extra money. Uh, divide up the, the venue and, and, and the actual ticket sales and all that shit. So that's that's my personal opinion why why they're on separate cards but really they should just been on the same card but I think it's a it's a decent fight I watched a bit of a yield the rim today kind of see it playing out similar to the Abraham fight he fights a bit like Abraham kind of come forward high guard not much upper body or head movement um, and just kind of his output is good but he's easy to hit and I don't think Eubank should have any issues with this dude um, I don't know if you've seen anything of him. Notable. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to me, Yildrim is like a poor man's Abraham. You know, they they kind of chose him, um, kind of knowing that. And I think, I think, yeah, Eubank's gonna come out probably looking pretty good. You know, he, he'll be able to kind of style on him and do as he pleases for the most part. Throw all those freaking thirty punch combos and <laughs> and uh, you know, kind of act a fool in there. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's a a reasonably um, hand, handy win for a uh, for a. Uh, for you, Bank. Yeah, I, uh, hope I don't we, think there'll be too much trouble from Yodrum. I hope we have a strong ref as well, because if uh, Yodrum starts to take a beating, like I just want it to be stopped because um, he looks like one of those guys that's too good, too, too tough for his own good. So we need either his his corner team or the the ref to take action and stop it. If you just ship in too many shots, and towards the end of a lot of Eubank fights, man, that his opponents start just taking in too many clean shots to the head, like. It, we know Abraham can take it, man, and he he took some fucking big shots off Eubank. Right. I don't think Eubank is like a c- concussive punch of one shot, but he is kind of like combinations start getting to you, man. Like especially what happened with Nick yeah. Blackwell. We don't need that repeated. But I was watched a bit of this uh, Yildirim Perabon fight, and as as kind of much as Perabon slipped, man, he was like catching Yildirim with a lot of uh, right uppercuts, and that's probably Eubank's favorite punch. So. Um, yep. I see my guy shipping a lot of uh, a, a lot of uppercuts. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna fucking quadruple the the uppercut. Exactly, <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically gonna be Street Fighter but real life. <laughs> Shoryukens just spamming him. 
Exactly. He does that cheat, you know, when you press when you get those special controllers and you just map the button to. Oh work. yeah, you, yeah, the turbo mode. Exactly. That's what's going to happen. But undercar wise, I think Eslan's still fucking going, man. I think I'm sure he's like seventy five years old, but he's fighting. Yeah, seriously. He's fighting Mauricio Barragan in a ten rounder. Um, I always like Aslan. He always kind of he's always had a fun style to watch but um I uh, think he's, damn he's 47 wow well, he's well, I, I, fuck it. I was joking i thought he's like 30 you didn't you know he's 47 that's crazy man yeah he's been around fucking forever man she um, all right what else we got um there's a card at your call it's on channel 5 and on spike uk so undercards on spike around i don't know seven half past seven eight o'clock the main event is on the uh, channel five Andrew Salbi versus Maximo Flores. I looked at this guy's resume now. The only name I really recognize is a guy you mentioned occasionally, um, uh, Milan Melendo. But apart from that, I don't know if you want to bring up on box rec. I've, I can't really recognize any anyone this dude's for. Um, well, uh, Martin Tecapuedla actually um, recently fought uh, Akira Yagashi. Gave uh, Yegashi like pretty much uh, all he could handle. Really, he had a draw against Tecapuedla. So, like Maximino Flores is a guy that's kind of just below like that world level. At the very least, he was just below that world level against 108 pounders. Um, at 112, I think some of uh, his advantages, like in terms of reach and everything, um, kind of go away, especially against you know Selby. Selby's a very quick guy, you know, a quick, tall, rangy guy. So I think um, I think this is really a good style matchup for Selby. I think. I think, um, excuse me, Flores is, um, skill-wise, is not too far behind where Selby's at. But I think Selby's speed and his uh, utilization distance and just the activity and everything will make it so that, you know, he'll be able to, to get a lot of rounds in and be able to nick any kind of close rounds and everything and get a, a pretty wide decision for him. But um, if Flores is able to kind of cut him off, um, he is actually a pretty good inside fighter. Um, in spite of the fact that he tends to utilize distance more so. Um, you know, his punches are a bit telegraphed. Uh, but you know he's kind of he's kind of a rugged, almost kind of stereotypical esque uh, fighter from Mexico. Uh, but you know he's a, he's a strong and, and durable and uh, tough one. So um, there could be some some spots where he gives uh, where he gives Selby some trouble. But overall, Selby should win the fight uh, pretty clearly. I think it'll be um, less dicey than it was against his uh, his last opponent Rosales. Yeah, Selby for me, skill wise and and talent wise, you can you know just off the eye test, you know he's got it, but. The lack of power, and I don't know, sometimes during the mid-rounds, he, he kind of goes into automatic mode, and he, he just goes on autopilot, and you can see that he, he's just doing stuff off you know muscle memory, and he kind of gets a bit boring, man. Halfway through a fight, I almost kind of zone out. I don't know if that happens to you. Um, and then kind of re-engage towards the last few rounds, and that quite happens often in a, in a, in a Salby fight for me when I'm watching him. Um, I just think sometimes he needs to, I know he lacks the power, but even just throwing a bit more and looking like you're going to try and get him out, have more intention, maybe, you know, put the referee in play, man, get him in the corner, throw lots of shots, and then maybe let, let the referee come and stop it, especially if the dude's kind of take took a beating through through the majority of the fight so yeah just just to change your pace i think selby needs at times man but yeah talent wise you know he's off the eye test he's got it but um yeah i mean i think there's a potential for this fight to be pretty good you know because it, it's really a matter of um if flores is able to kind of cut him down i'm not, I'm not sure if he necessarily has the, the foot speed to do that against a, a taller guy like that yep undercar wise like i don't recognize most of the names only one i do is Lim's girlfriend Chantal Cameron, she's fighting a third professional fight against TBA so far, so that's not good. But it's supposed to be eight rounder, so I don't know who they're gonna find that short notice to fight eight rounds against her for three minutes as well, because she's uh, yeah. one of these women that's um, an advocate of fighting the three minute rounds opposed to the two. And what else have we got? Box Nation have got a pretty shitty card in uh, Edinburgh, topped by Gary Cornish versus Sa- Sam Sexton for the for the vacant British title. Uh, Stephen Simmons is on there against Simon Barclay, and yeah, it's a pretty poor card overall. And that's about it. I think we've got something in Mexico, Jorge Paz Jr. versus Jose Carlos Paz, but I don't really know if that's a good fight or not, Neil. So. Um, Jose Carlos Paz. Like, honestly, 
that name doesn't ring a bell, so it's probably a reasonably easy fight for Jorge Paz Jr. And now Tomas Rojas is on there too, former super flyweight champ, but he's all the way up at super featherweight now, so it's any wonder uh, as to how good he's really going to be there. Um, uh, tomorrow there's a good fight though on uh, Fox Sports 1, PBC on Fox Sports. Uh, Devin Alexander versus Walter Castillo. Um, How's that tomorrow? Alexander's... Yeah, yeah, it's tomorrow. Where the fuck is Devin yeah. been, man? Yeah, man, he didn't. He pretty much didn't do shit after Aaron Martinez. I guess he had some sort of, like he was addicted to painkillers or something. Um, after that fight with uh, with Martinez, and he had some sort of issues. But uh, yeah, he's he's back in the mix now. Uh, almost two year layoff, or actually no, more than a two year layoff. Uh, but he's fighting a pretty tough opponent coming back. I mean, uh, Castillo gave uh, Amiri Mama a pretty good fight. Um, I thought he was giving Lipinets a pretty good fight up until you know Lipinets stopped him. Um, you know, one of those guys that's kind of a, a fringe, kind of 140 guy. Um, so, I mean, this this could be kind of a dangerous opponent for somebody like Alexander. He tends to be a little bit more finessed with it coming back. You know, Castillo's a bit of like kind of a high volume, kind of rugged, you know, hard man, as you might say over there in the UK. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I think I think it, I think it might be a, p- a pretty good fight coming down tomorrow. Nice. Anything else fight-wise? I did remember a fight that's been announced that we haven't discussed, but anything else fight-wise fight wise this week? Um, No, I think I think we pretty much uh, covered it all. Just about, yeah. So we were talking about the Wilder Ortiz fight, and um, we didn't really get into no card, but we did mention uh, Bermain versus uh, Bermain Stavern versus Dominic Brazil, but also one that got mentioned is Sean Porter versus your boy Adrian Granados. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's a good fight. That's a good fight. Um, I, honestly, I think Porter's probably a bit too too strong. Yeah. For Granados, Granados is a guy that you know he he's a, he's he almost kind of reminds me, I guess, maybe of like uh, like Josecito Lopez, like where he was really good at 140, really solid, could get it anybody a tough fight. Yeah. But at against kind of bigger, stronger guys, like somebody that's very physical, like Just a Porter, I think is where he's really going to come up short. Yeah. No, I agree. Like I like it as a fight because I like Granados, but. Sean Porter's too big, man, and that style, that kind of rushing forward linebacker style, like is is it's not going to favor Granados, I don't think. Yeah, I think I think that's like probably the worst style for him, <laughs> to be honest with you, because I think um, he's a bit better either when he's pressing you, or when he's kind of uh, take we're either like when he's all the way on the inside or all the way on the outside, kind of uh, like playing the back foot yeah. role. Um, but yeah, to, just uh, somebody I think just kind of yeah, just linebacking him and. <laughs> Scoring a sack on him and all that shit, I think I think is gonna, I think is gonna not not fare well for him because there are certain moments where in between kind of his side to side movement, he'll kind of stand straight up, and that's exactly what Porter wants you to do, to kind of um, go into heavy bag mode and just you know go ripping full full bore with those wide hooks and everything. Yeah, and just like beat you down with his headbutts as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, there there could be a lot of head clashes in this fight with the, with the way that they both kind of freely swing. Yeah, definitely. But I'm done, Naoto. You got anything else? Uh, no. I mean, that's. I think we we pretty much exhausted it, man. I don't. Kind I, of a slow week. I don't know how we did ninety minutes, man. That that, that, that went pretty quick. Yeah, seriously. And we should we should be giving credit, man. We we got we got some of the best stamina in the game. Ah oh, shit, man. Canelo needs to come train with us. For sure, man. Got to teach him the tricks of the trade. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Naoto. Thank you to all the people in the chat and all the people that download the show week in, week out. We'll be back next week. Peace. You just listened to the Boxing Coalition. I did. Man, I love boxing. I fucking love boxing. A big shout out to the Boxing Coalition. You're a newbie. No, I ain't new, man. If my fucking next door neighbor became the number one flyweight in the world, do you know what I'd do? I'd fucking walk past the country. Derek, how you doing, bro? I was physically burning you, blood. I disagree. First time I hear the song, man, it was fucking badass. Vamos a Argentina, la concha de su madre. I see the bomb in them. I get home and she's like, what the fuck? Me and the kid are here. Why don't you get home and talk to us? I'm like, man, you guys don't know shit about boxing. Kel, how does it feel to be the new IBF champion? Feels great. Feels great. Do we really dive into the black hole right off the jump? I think he's hiding glass. Just to play devil's advocate. You want one portion of crow or two portions of crow? Give me uh, two portions with a super-sized fries and, um, and a large drink, please. I can't stand them while I'm Scottish. Cringe side. But you won't crush Anthony fucking fat-ass Joshua, would you? He's not fat. Yeah, How about you tell us what you weighed for your final thoughts? <laughs>
My way. Thank you for listening to the Boxing Coalition. We are live every Monday, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. UK time, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern.